Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. I am your host, Jimmy Drab, and my guest tonight, as you could see from the button you've just pressed to get here, uh, is Eric Paul. Eric Paul is the singer of uh, currently the band Psychic Graveyard. I did have the full-length record. I just forgot to bring it with me when I went to go uh, have my interview with Eric. But that's their... uh, their debut full-length record, which is an amazing record. You should go pick it up. And I also got the new EP. It's the new release from Psychic Graveyard. Uh, five tracks. Um, you can find a digital download of this if you'd like, uh, anywhere that you can find music. This is also a great record, and you are currently listening to the 19th Circuit off of this EP. If you're streaming this, if you're watching the video, then you're actually going to catch a little clip of a video footage I took from them live at AS220 in Providence uh, when they were performing about a month ago, maybe a little less than that, uh, also with Oceans of the Moon, and a new band uh, locally, Alpha Error, uh, who's uh, very cool, you should check them out, um, Oceans of the Moon with Rick Pel- Pelletier, uh, former guest of, this, uh, of the show, which is also awesome, uh, check them out as well. So much to get into. Eric has had a, a very lengthy career uh, doing music and poetry, so there's so much to get into. Um, I just hope I did my best getting it all in in this hour. Uh, very little to no edits uh, on the audio stream, and the video stream is also very, very few edits. Um, I found our conversation to be compelling enough and just kind of insightful enough that I, there was really nothing I wanted to kind of cut out. Um, so... If you like to listen, anywhere you find audio streams, there it is. Here it is. You're listening to it now. Ta-da. Video stream on YouTube. Um, Just a couple things I want to say really quickly is that uh, I appreciate everyone coming and listening and tuning in to all the episodes. Um, I I do not ask for money to to help promote this show or help uh, fund this show. I run a business. That's how this show got started was me doing my uh, my record resale business. So links are in the home pages of either of those, uh, either of the formats that you're watching or listening to now. And uh, I please just ask you, hey, go buy, go buy a record for me, okay? I'll get it out to you. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, that way, you buying a record from me helps me out. You buying these records from Eric helps him out. And we really appreciate it. So um, enjoy the show. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Please do all the things that you do with the internet. Like, subscribe, share, uh, comment, whatever it is you you like to do. Well, we'll see it. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Enjoy this talk. start anyway as far as uh, you guys being involved in Chinese stars together I think um, well Craig and I wanted to start a band so then we wanted Craig wanted a bass player because we had not played with the bass player in so long that and our first thought was Rick it was literally because Craig and I have been worshipping Rick and Satellite since we were literally in high school yeah so we 
we thought of Rick first, and then we, you know, we were fans of Law Machine, so he was occasionally doing these Law Machine shows. And what we really liked about what he was doing with Law Machine was that he was actually tapping into this um, jaw wobble mm. bass sound, or even more like dub music, like King yeah. Tubby style bass lines, and, yeah. and we just love that. And that's Craig was like, "This is what I want to, you know, play with." Obviously, like you, you you're just around him, and he's a magical person. So you just kind of want to yeah. play music with him. And he wasn't doing too too much at the time, and then we had reconnected recently because he was helping us get a couple singles for the stolen single, the Arab on Radar stolen singles. Yep. So we were kind of like at his house a little bit. He was actually living with Ben and Oscar at the time, and we would just be there or getting some singles from Ben, and we would hang out with Rick, and then it just kind of came up naturally mm. and said, hey, you know, what are you doing for the next few years? <laughs> yeah. And he was like, uh, <clears throat> we were psyched. We didn't think he'd say yes. I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah. We just didn't think he would. Yeah. And that's how it kind of started. He, he, along with you, I think, and the members of Arab on Radar, I feel like have always been these unapproachable types. Like, because you take... Weird. Well, I mean, because when I first met you, I mean... I guess, I don't remember when we first met, but we ended up working together briefly. Mm -hmm. And so that was cool because I was like, oh, and I can actually get to hang out with him for a little while and actually kind of pick his brain. And I'm now I don't have to feel, no, I, <laughs> now I don't have to feel awkward because yeah. I, I, actually, I didn't even know your band at the time. Because uh -huh. uh, you invited me to your show at the Columbus. Oh, that's which right. Which was the first uh, experience I had with Aragon Radar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was amazing. Yeah, we were very worried about that show. <laughs> um. No one had had a show there before. Oh, Up right. until that time, they were showing adult films there. Right. And I was um, dating this woman who actually lived in the property. There was a rental, some rental properties in, above that are attached to Columbus. Yeah. Oh. So we were, so we were dating there, and she was getting a reduction in her rent because she was helping them with a website or something like that. And I said, "Do you ever think if you'd ever entertain the idea of us having an event here?" She approached him with it, and at first he didn't, I think his name was John, he didn't quite, couldn't wrap his brain around it at first, hmm. but then after a few times I said, I can promise this many people, you'll make this much money, so I was so stressed out because I had made him this promise that like yeah. 300 people would be there, Yeah. so then I put like the best possible bill that I could put together, and then just stressed out about it, and right. uh, I was like, what if no one comes, and I, you know. This guy's all bummed out and stuff, so that's why I think I told every single, I invited my family, like everybody I knew, I was like, please just come to the one, this one show so I don't fail this man. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had it, and it was great. There ended up being like 280 people or something like that, and he was so ecstatic. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so let me, where were we? Get back to, uh, well, so we were talking we were about, on something fun. you know, things. Oh, no, we weren't. It was being not misinterpreted. Yeah, it was a breast cancer thing. Let's not talk about that. Well, I mean, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to go into detail, but the, the emphasis was on how yeah. uh, I think that you, you and your lyrics get misinterpreted and you get kind yeah. of like uh, painted into this box mm -hmm. where, you know, nobody who knows you personally or even knows the band well yeah. will just say like, well, these guys are just some misogynistic or sexist or, yeah. or just kind of maniacs. Yeah, yeah. you're just maniacs <laughs> in general. Yeah, I, and I think the breast cancer thing was me in my own way, trying to w raise awareness, but it was also a, it was a huge responsibility to ask of me, because I was like, I don't, I, I don't know how to do this, right. and they asked me, so I did it in my own stupid way, right. <laughs> and it was meant as a joke, but, you know, it's like everything else, it's, it wasn't, it didn't come off well, but I, I wish I didn't say it. Right, <laughs> and so that goes along with everything, including, you know, the, the show at the Columbus, and Kind of, uh, that was to it. me the breast cancer thing was really a that was stupid Eric but the Columbus I felt like why would we not have a cool cultural event in a beautiful building that has this beautiful cultural past like right. uh, to me that one was a little intense that people were angry at us about it right but um, you just I don't know you just kind of have to do it and people will always find right. reasons to be angry at you. Well, yeah. I mean, especially that band. That's that's what yeah. I think was the problem was that people wanted people that didn't love you guys because mm -hmm. of either the performance or because mm -hmm. of the actual music. Yeah, it was like 
people that don't understand it, you know, yeah. you, you, you fear what you don't understand. Yeah. And with that yeah. being said, it's just like, well, this, these bits, spans called Arab on Radar. Well, what the fuck is that supposed to say? Yeah. And then, you know, and then you look into the lyrics and it's just like, well, he's talking about all this, like, you know, drug yeah. use and sex and yeah, like, yeah. you know, and it sounds, you know, some, something that a, a good wholesome person doesn't want their children exposed to mm -hmm. type thing, you know? Mm -hmm. and yeah. I guess that's how that kind of happens. What was so funny though about the name of the band is it, it, it wasn't quote unquote racist for a really long time. And then suddenly, like everything else, Right. That, because of the geopolitical situation, that then became, it took on a new meaning. You know what right. I'm saying? So oh, yeah. at that time, when we came up with the name, 94, 95 or something like that, like, you know, it wasn't, there was no, um, I think the only event that had sort of happened was we had invaded, or we were protecting Kuwait at that point. Mm -hmm. And there was the war that George... H. W. Bush had involved us in, right? But it, there wasn't that. There wasn't that much. Uh, I don't know, like awareness about the word. It was, I don't know how to explain this, but it didn't have that like trigger. Right. The word Arab yeah. in 1994. I mean, honestly, it was mostly inspired by The Stranger by Albert Camus. Mm -hmm. I loved. I love and loved the. Stranger, and I remembered loving the word Arab from just as simply um, just appreciating a word, yeah. <laughs> you know. And I just loved the word so much, uh -huh. and then it was just pieced together that way. Right. So it was kind of random in a lot of ways, and it didn't mean anything in 1994. And then suddenly, when things shifted, and we became, you know, rhetoric. Um, started, oh, who do we hate now? Well, now it's got to be them, so we can blow them up, and then. You know, you know how they, they just, who do we hate today? Who do we blow up today kind right. of thing? So then, you know, people that were mindful of the phrase Arab on radar, and they should have been, should have been, this could be perceived as very strange. Like, mm. Almost like you suddenly are these right wing and you want to put Arabs on radar. And, you know, like it, right. it changed. But or like, even the association with yeah. the war being like Arab on radar. What does that mean? Is yeah. that it's a military stance? You yeah. talking like militaristic? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah had like a, almost like once once that issue became, or we became, or the public became more aware of how much horrible shit we were doing in the Middle East, the, the, the tone of the word Arab on radar, or the tone of the word Arab James, Arab on radar took on a new meaning. But literally, it was, we looked at, we liked the way it looked. It was almost like a... a Palindrome. Oh yeah. I don't know. There was just it was one of those things that were like, yeah, that sounds odd, mysterious, and it has a nice ring to it. And I love the stranger. You know what I mean? It was right. so innocent the decision, but then it obviously snowballed. And so that's just been your fault. This your own your whole career is just like being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or saying the wrong <laughs> thing, or having the wrong yeah. ideas. <laughs> I mean, I I definitely take responsibility for a lot of crazy stuff yeah. I said, though. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, But I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I think that I was very careless, and it was well, just from a point that I, it's just who I was at the time. I was living carelessly. I was completely out of my mind. I was, you know, just, that's all yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. it was just making a lot of dangerous decisions. And looking back on it now, like you were talking about earlier, I understand the weight of my words now, but at the time I didn't. More I mean, so than ever now. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I didn't even think anyone would even listen to our band. It was literally, we were writing for ourselves. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like no one's going to hear this anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then when people started to hear it, it became about, oh shit. <laughs> right. You know? And but, then you start seeing pushback from people yeah. about certain things. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think it was kind of right that they did. It was, it was kind of nice because... Yeah. I made a lot of decisions. I, I think if I changed a lot of the pronouns in those lyrics, it would have had a very different meaning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't very create, courageous then. I mean, a lot of it was about my trauma as a childhood, tra childhood trauma and sexual assault and all the stuff that I experienced as a kid. But I didn't have enough courage to kind of completely come out public about it. Yeah. So I kept singing as I would adapt these different points of view so it seemed like I was taking like a vile or callous approach. Mm. So instead of saying, you know, uh, 
I would say like I blah 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 I, but it was actually somebody else. So he actually did it. Right. But I would say I because I just wanted that vile feeling. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Well, it, I mean that kind of goes with all writing in general, especially yeah. in, uh, in poetics. Is yeah. that you, you you're 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 in in, in fact uh, creating a story, and it doesn't have to necessarily be. Um, uh, what's that? What's the word for that? When it's all about yourself. Um, First person narrative. Yeah. Well, basically, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have or to be autobiographical. Autobiographical, yeah. exactly. You know, it's just like and. I know that some people think about music being like, well, from from a singer, like from a, uh, when you're listening to music, whoever's writing that those words, whoever's mm-hmm. singing those those words, that's their perspective. That's them yeah, yeah. speaking about themselves. When in fact, it doesn't necessarily have to. No, be. it doesn't. But no, I mean that's it's funny because I, uh, you know, as a college professor, that's one of the things that I have to tell all my first, second year poetry students: the speaker is not always the poet. Mm-hmm. You know. The poet can be whoever they choose to be in, in, in any given poem. Yeah. So when you're referring to it or discussing it, it's the speaker said this, the speaker believes this, the speaker is doing this. It's not always the poet is doing this. There has to be that disconnect. Mm-hmm. And that's, I didn't, that, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing when I was writing a lot of those lyrics. I was literally just getting them out. Mm-hmm. some sort of emotional bloodletting of, of sorts. But looking back on it, I always, now that I know more about writing, I was like, geez, if I just tr- changed, yeah, changed the perspective slightly, it wouldn't have been as inflammatory. But how you were saying, like, it's it's not necessarily autobiographical. It's not necessarily the, the, the writer speaking directly about their own experience, mm-hmm. creating story, but then, like, the imagery that, that the word the words have, mm-hmm. uh, because like I was doing this, I was listening to your music, listening to a lot of it from all the bands, Sarah Radar, mm-hmm. Doomsday Student, Second Graveyard, mm-hmm. all of it. And I love all the music. The music has a certain feel to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a lyric person. Mm-hmm. So when I listen to music, lyrics and the songs and the singing is kind of like another instrument. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just another layer that creates the song. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I've heard the words. You know, I can sing along to a degree. I don't sing mm-hmm. along with your songs, but mm-hmm. I mean, I know the words and like yeah. how I... It, yeah, you know. they, they play in your head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But reading the words, because mm-hmm. I got your new book, mm-hmm. which I should probably pull out, but uh, it's, it's right over there. <laughs> um, it's a retrospective on your, all of your lyrics. Mm-hmm. And so I was reading along with all the lyrics without the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was just like, wow, this shit is... It, it makes me think... It, it puts an image in my head. Yeah. And all of it is typically like of a of a like dark and seedy, murky yeah. image. Like yeah. if I were an artist, mm-hmm. this would all be like kind of like bleak and, and grotesque. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and it's beautiful mm-hmm. because I can I can appreciate what, what that what that is. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like what we were saying beforehand, where people call you out on on whatever kind of content your they think your band is mm-hmm. trying to push, whatever mm-hmm. agenda it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the ability to do that is just beautiful in general. It's a beautiful art. Mm. I think that's accidental, though. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, what what I do is just very self-serving. It's yeah. just about exp- it's writing and music is just the way for me to get through the shit I get through, and I don't ever think about its result or or how it sometimes will be. Yeah. You know, that, that the perception that's yeah, not, that yeah, going to land somebody. Yeah, I don't, I don't think about that as much, but I understand it. It, it does that. Right. Like I just from releasing something and be like, wow, this isn't going like I uh, anticipated it would go. Like, but I also then I guess it gets a little bit deeper. Like, what motivates you to do this in the first place? Yeah. And it's always just because even those early lyrics were all taken from journals that I had used in the. So I started seeing a counselor when I was a teenager and I had trouble talking about things. Yeah. You know, I just, I would get in there and I'd be like, I know I have to be here right now because things are not going well. Right. And I like you a lot and you're incredibly intelligent, but I don't know how to start, you know? And she just said, just write things down during the week and then come in and read them. Mm. And that's where a lot of the images came from and, they're all memories, a lot of weird 
obscured, uh, uh, abstracted memories, and that's kind of where they came from. Mm. So uh, once I've once I've learned that I could communicate that and get it out of my head and body, yeah, outside of me, right. it felt fucking great. <laughs> so then that's why I have, so I've always just done it. I mean, in the last three years, a lot of the lyrics are about my son and how painful the journey is sometimes with my son and mm. and a lot of different things like that. So I don't ever stop and think about it in the terms of like, am I pushing people and my being antagonistic I think it just happens and I just think it's maybe just my approach at self-healing yeah maybe I just not self-healing in a way that's appropriate <laughs> I don't know I mean if it feels good right and if it feels good and you feel it's like me, you, it you've made progress yeah. you feel like you, you you're pushing through those things like that I still think only way not to do it yeah like I, it's, it's, it was the first successful coping mechanism I had as a teenager mm. to write the words, put them on an album, you know, put them to music, and then get on stage and sing them and act them out right. with those guys. And mm. that became so healing. And then when there were these small successes that happened, it felt it felt really good, you mm. know? And then that was the only thing that worked. And I tried a lot of other different things, and they help but they're not the one things that work. In fact, you know, as someone who's 44, I sometimes freak out what I'm going to do when I can't do this. Right. I literally don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I just kind of keep doing it. Because right. right. I'm like, okay, what other thing can, you know, do, I mean, does golf cure anything? I don't know. <laughs> what, what do I do? I, I just forgot what else trying. does that, right? Yeah. I retire in golf. I don't know. I really, I just don't know. You know, I guess I could just, I don't know, focus more on writing or I, I don't know, but right. it's just, it's also intertwined. Mm. I guess the point I'm making is I, I just don't think about who it triggers or how it triggers or anything, but I guess right. it does. As long as it's working for you, I suppose. I mean, fuck everybody else, right? I mean, whatever anybody else thinks about it, however they want to take it, I guess, yeah. you know, if you're really exercising your demons and that's how you do it and yeah. it, it's good work, I mean, what's, what's the harm, I suppose? Yeah. But then again, if you could say that to about Ted Bundy, right? Well, that's the thing is, you're I'm not harming anybody. I know, I, you know you're not but harming. that's the argument that people make against me is that my language is harmful or the past language. I haven't, right. I haven't gone down that road in a long time. Right. I'm actually a lot more mindful to not, um, yeah, to use that language, and I, I almost feel like it's, it's kind of exciting because it's, it's posing a, you know, a creative challenge to myself mm -hmm. to, to capture the same raw energy or raw insights into things without you well without using easily inflammatory language mm -hmm. and that's what's been kind of a cool challenge so i yeah. i'm very mindful now of that stuff okay um but you know i it's tough i mean it is because there is in the last you know 20 years we've seen that these small changes or the things that we've become mindful of, or this new, you know, newer generations become mindful of, they are they are affecting changes, you know. Right. So it is kind of nice to see that, and sometimes when I do look back on it, I was like, "Shit, man, that was definitely part of the problem." <laughs> well, but part know. of the problem, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that kind of weight on yourself. I mean, because think, okay, think about this way. So when you were talking, I, this the first thing you know in mind was like. Uh, you know, say you said Ted Bundy, I was thinking, like, mm -hmm. um, what's his name, uh, Charles Manson. Okay. Yeah, he, he was coping with a horrible life. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, I'm, I don't, I'm not familiar completely with his background, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, you look at the at the effect of what happened, what he did, mm -hmm. and where was the inspiration for that? Oh, it was the Beatles, Helter Skelter. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that seems pretty, pretty harmless, right? The Beatles, I mean, yeah. you know, peace, love, and, yeah. and everything, and... That's where this guy took it. That's his, that's yeah. his interpretation and, and what he wanted to do with it. So yeah. I don't think I don't I don't I would never hold an artist responsible mm -hmm. for anything. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I, it's it's not it's not like that was the the desired effect. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul McCartney wasn't thinking like I want to inspire someone to you know start a cult and kill people. <laughs> you know, it was it's it was I just wanted to create the loudest rock song I could create. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's very it's very. Um, you know, uh, sincere and honest, and and the furthest thing from what ended up being a repercussion of, you know. So, I don't know. If that's... He's interesting though, Charles. Not, not that I want to talk about Charles Manson now, but it's interesting that he has been, or had served most of his adult life in 
prison, but had never killed any of those people. Right. Which just inspired the killing, which is, it's, it's incredible how fearful the public was of him because mm. of, like, they almost couldn't fathom how powerful or how someone could actually convince other people to act like that. Right. Yeah, but he, he was, he was born, um, his mother was, like, a teenage prostitute. And he was, when born, I think she tried, maybe, I don't know too, too much about it, but tried to raise him, wasn't able to, and he was in foster care or in and out of the system most of his lives, most yeah. of his life. So he was basically in institutions from when he was a very young kid. And then those are pretty cruel institutions. Yeah. He was exposed to a lot of violence and sexual assault. And so basically his whole entire life he'd been surviving. So the whole Charles Manson thing or the the idea to devise this sort of cult leader um, persona was more about survival for him, mm. you know, and yeah. not manipulating, but getting himself <clears throat> in a position to survive. Right. And then people that he was with just kind of took it and ran with it. So this is much about the people that he influenced, I think, as much as him. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting, uh, and he has an interesting story. Yeah. It is a pretty fucked up one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, speaking of um, influences and being fucked up, uh, the record you decided to choose tonight, mm -hmm. uh, Public Image Limited's uh, Metal Box is the official name. Yeah, the I think. original printing or original edition was Metal Box, and right. they called it Second Edition when it came out in a more palatable format. Right. Right. More. Uh, Available for the record label, I suppose, and yeah. as far as manufacturing was concerned. Yeah, probably a lot <clears throat> cheaper to make. Yeah, uh, a lot cheaper to make. I, I don't know what they charged for these back in the day, back in, uh, what, 79 was it, when it was released? Mm -hmm. And um, But this is it, and I was very surprised that you had this, because I didn't know. I mean, you know, yeah. I kind of asked you, like, well, what, what record do you want to kind of focus on? And I'm having a hell of a time with this, because... You can't get it out. Yeah. It's like a fucking... Um, it's, well, it's never... I mean, I bought this... 10 plus years ago, 15 years ago, and I've never opened it. It's just, I just have it. Oh, really? Oh, because yeah. you have some. Yes, I used to, I just listened to my backup co copy. Oh, well, stuff. then I appreciate you uh, taking and that then there, This is James turning red, trying to yeah. open up a metal can. And yeah, that's hard to it. do for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this is so cool, man, because I, you know, I was researching this. I actually had been uh, kind of turned on to private and uh, public image limited uh, not too long ago mm -hmm. and I kind of started going through the catalog and, and I found out about this because you know mm -hmm. in, in record resale world that I've been, been living in lately this is one, kind of one of those things where it's like oh this is kind of like one of those gold gems like if you mm -hmm. can find this yeah. and I was just thinking today I was just like oh man I wonder if I could ever find one Oh, and now oh. you have one. <laughs> Get your hands off of that man. Oh man I can't, <laughs> I can't help myself it's so, it's so exciting because uh, it's so I don't know. The research behind records, like as far as like selling them is concerned, mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. It's kind of kind of fascinating to me um, because of it's it's all these little details. It's like well, th this is pretty obvious. So it's like okay, well, it's in the metal tent. Mm -hmm. so that's pretty obvious. That like what kind of edition this can be. But I, you know, first asked you if it was from the UK or not because I think they did UK. And I don't know if they did a US pressing of this that actually, with the metal tent. No, yeah. Except for a reissue. I think they recently. Reissued it. Oh, and they did. Then, yeah, reissued oh, it in like a metal tin. Yeah. Um, also, a CD version of like a plastic metal tin, and like with one CD in it. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is very cool, man. I, I thank you for for taking this out and let me take a look at it and let, let us listen to it for a little mm. bit. The first time I've ever played it. Just now. Mm -hmm. Oh man. I had never played it before. And it looks like it was virtually unplayed. I no, mean, I don't even know if it was played. I mean, when I got it, it looked brand new to me. But I yeah. know there was some of that. Wrote, like I said, wrote a pencil on the insert, and that's the only thing I noticed about it. Yeah, I wonder actually if that was, now that I closed it up again, I wonder if that was their uh, desired listening format, because, you know, these, these records, there's three records in here, uh -huh. and each side has uh, at most two songs, I think. The first side, the first disc, first side is Albatross, is 11 minutes long, that's mm -hmm. the one on yeah. there. But uh, I also read that uh, in the research was that they kind of did that because they didn't want the listener to necessarily um, listen from top to bottom. They wanted them to have the ability to kind of just put on whichever record they wanted and like kind of whatever song they wanted, oh, in whatever that, order they neat. wanted. Because that's actually how I started. Like I was saying earlier, I started listening to 
I always thought Swan Lake began the album. <laughs> and oh, yeah. It always just started with Swan Lake. And actually, well, I don't think it wasn't. It was until I heard like a digital copy of this that I realized the real tracking order. What the tracking order was. Yeah. yeah. I, I still remember um, when I first heard this album. Isn't that uh, wild? I think it was in. I don't know exactly which what year, but I believe it was 1994. And Andrea. Fizette, who was the bass player, the first bass player of, um, our, well, the only bass player of our band. Yeah. At the time we started the band, she was dating John McLean, who was the guitar player of 600 Satellite. And now he does a project called The Juan McLean. Oh, yeah. And Andrea and John were living together on Medway Street. And I remember going over to pick Andrea up for, um, rehearsal one night and she was running a bit late and John McLean played this for me. He was like, you need to hear this album. Oh, yeah. And it was really cool because at that time, that's when they started experimenting. Actually, it might've even been earlier because it was around the time that they started um, mutating their sound a bit because they used to have very heavily distorted guitars and um, they had like dissonant riffs, but they didn't have that sort of jarring sound that you heard on, on um, Pigeon is the Most Popular Bird. And it was kind of cool to hear one of the albums that was directly speaking or informing that new sound that they were venturing into. So he played this for me, and I remember just being blown away by this album. And then um, obviously not finding the metal box, I found this, this co print copy of it, or mm -hmm. this normal vinyl copy of it. And... Um, and I just loved it. And um, this album informed or inspired all of the early Arab on Radar songs with Andrew, because Andrew was incredibly inspired by Jaw ja Wobbles playing on this. Yeah. It was incredibly inspired by the sound of it. We loved the largely improvisational feel of it. And I think even if I remember, they did a lot of the songs were largely improvisational. They had the tape rolling, and then they just sort of kept the best takes of things. Um, some of the vocals were done, or I think all of them were done after, but some of the vocals were even improvisational, I guess. Yeah. The, uh, Albatross was. And um, that was one of the things that we were trying to aim for in some of the earlier um, Arab stuff, is we would get in a room and just play for hours, and then usually just take some of the best moments and put them into these loose arrangements. Mm. A lot of it's because we weren't all that certain on how to arrange songs at that time. Yeah. Uh, but also we just loved the sort of feeling that each one of these songs could just fall off a cliff at any moment. Yeah. And we loved the feeling of that, you know? Uh -huh. And that's, remember one of the things that I heard when listening to it with John McClane on his couch that, that, that night, I said, I feel like at any moment, like, the drums are going to fall apart or the guitar is going to break a string. Like it just had this tension to it, all yeah. the songs. And I loved that tension to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. From what I, uh, what I had heard and, and researched was that, uh, they had a very, uh, limited recording budget because the advance that they got, they put towards manufacturing this. Oh, I gotcha. So yeah. and I don't know how they did that either, where they, they figured out the manufacturing before they even recorded the project. And but I don't um, know. I mean, it must have just been someone had this thought or had this idea for packaging, right? And then that just sort of led the way right. for the whole project. But gosh, am I thankful they made this album? And it was funny because I remember growing up as a kid, you know, being in like the junior high, ninth grade, and stuff, and being really into like the Sex Pistols and mm -hmm. like, the culture of it and stuff. And then when I literally did not know that. Johnny Lydon was in this band until like 1992 or three. And then when John played this, I said, this is the guy from the Sex Pistols? Yeah. Like it was, I couldn't wrap my brain around it, but mm. how fucking amazing is it to go from a band like that to a band like this? Like yeah. two incredibly revolutionary bands, whether you like Sex Pistols or not, it's, it was certainly, you know, it turned the earth in a different direction. Yeah. And this did as well, you know? Right. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Hmm. So unfortunately, they've turned into such a grumpy old asshole now, but they right. really made two crazy records. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that that had something to do with like the the manufactured aspect of Sex Pistols. 
Because like, mm, I mean, yeah. punk was breaking. Punk yeah. was like becoming this thing that people were seeing, looking to as being like, this could be a big thing. Yeah. And they were manufactured along with the Clash, which yeah. is also like, you know, mind blowing when you're like, when you think about these two legendary punk bands mm. as being like, they were put together like a boy band. Mm. Sorry, yeah. They were. I mean, yeah. they legitimately like were kind of like had management. Yeah. That was just like I can make you the biggest rock band in the world. You know, so strange. Yeah, <laughs> and so then, so you know, the Sex Pistols ends, and then Johnny Lydon, birth name Lydon, not not Rotten, mm -hmm. was you know, continues out making music and ends up creating this band, uh, along with you know Chad Warnbull and uh, was it Keith Keith Levine? Levine. Yeah, yeah. Keith Levine. Geez, he informed a lot of all every guitar player I've ever played with has been obsessed with Keith Keith Levine. Really. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, um, Paul, the era, who's in you know, Chinese stars, he was used to it in, in so like a graveyard. Right? He plays a, a wedge because Keith Levine played a wedge. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That weird triangular shape yeah. guitar he has? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Very obsessed with Keith Levine. <laughs> yeah. Well, he has yeah. his moments where he obsesses about things. Yeah. I guess that's does. the most recent. Yeah. Well, it's been ongoing. I guess he's had this now for 12 years, the wedge. Because actually, he posted a photo, or he sent me a photo recently of him playing it 11 years ago. So he's been at about 11, 12 years. Wow. Um, like, I, I don't think the wedge was the only Travis Bean that Keith Levine played. I think he probably played a few different yeah. types, but some of the footage that we saw of him, he was playing it. Yeah. And we were like, uh, well, more, more, more like Paul was like, I, I want that guitar. I want to play only that guitar. But he does, Paul does have a Travis Bean. Um, but again, it's one of those things that it's that glassy, metallic, harsh sound. Yeah. And, and I think that's why the metal box is so appropriate. It's such mm. a great concept because the albums have almost a metallic sound to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's almost like his, the microphone he's singing out of is like a tin can. And the guitar is sounds like it's got, you know, I don't know, these intense metal, playing yeah. through a metal guitar and intense metal strings. And yeah. The drums are glassy, and I don't know, it's, it's really yeah. cool. So it's, I wonder if, when they were deciding upon the production of it, if this was in their minds. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. It all works, either. though, so well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd like well, to be buried with this record. Right. Well, maybe, maybe you can make that happen. Yeah. But uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing it on and uh, letting us take a look at it and listen to it for the first time. Very honored. <laughs> um, so let's see. Speaking of your influences, I want to bring your book out. Okay. I actually, uh, I brought this whole bag of goodies. It's mm -hmm. all Eric Paul stuff. <laughs> it's I'll, everything. I'll be, I'm going to be carried with all that as well. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but you have a lot more than this because this is old. This is my personal collection stuff. Well, we might have to journey into my basement and see what you need. Sure. Right. That actually is some of the stuff. Most of the stuff is from you. Um, I bought this your new book. Mm -hmm. That's it. Suitcase full of uh, dirt. I'm going to get a little close up for the people so you can see it. But, uh, you know, I am uh, very excited to say that I have a lot of this stuff from you, actually. Um, I, uh, I have since sold off, I bought that for you, the single, when it came out. Aww. It's like a graveyard, the newest thank band. Thank you. You gave this to me, the Air Bond Radar, Young yeah, Way, the thank Highway you. I think it, I Sessions. Think it goes out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is like a legitimate <laughs> aluminum, right? And it's just like a heavyweight metal. Yeah, uh, but then someone who will remain nameless drew penises all over the metal, if you notice. Oh, wow. I'm spiked. Really? Yeah. A very nice person, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't say that it's a nice thing to do, but um, I can probably imagine. Um, yeah, you gave me this too? Mm -hmm. Your poem, your poetry? Yeah. Uh, which is excellent. I uh, yeah, that one's out of print now, I guess. Yeah. Well, there wasn't many of them made either, right? I think he made five hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, Silk the saddle. Mm -hmm. This is a, a reissue, I think, right? Yeah, that's unfortunately the. Uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, the, 
We have, um, when we did the reunion, they did a, um, a, a new batch of them. And then when the reunion quickly collapsed, I was sitting with too many of those. So really? I've been giving them to every, my postman has one. And yeah, my person who uh, cuts my lawn has one. It's really, yeah. really? That's a great bartering uh, item. <laughs> um, so speaking of that, uh, so you need the new album. The new. You need the new one. Doomsday Suite record? No, Psychic Graveyard. Oh, I have it. Oh. Where is it? Oh, no, no, no. Well, if you don't have it, you'll leave with a copy. No, I have the full, I have the first full length record. I don't have the new uh, EP. Oh, I have the new EP. Sure. It just came out on CD. I guess they're going to try to make a vinyl copy. Well, you know, you really have to sell those. I don't, I don't want to start, <laughs> I just don't want to start taking things from you. I don't, I, I don't care. Well, I know. Okay, <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, I'll, I'll take it, but you know, I want everyone else to know that they should go out and buy it. Yes, everyone else can buy it, but James came to my home and brought me beer, so right. he gets one for free. Yeah, everyone else will be like, I'll do that, dude. I'll come to you. Just tell me where to come. I'll come. No, don't tell anyone where right <laughs> There will be some undesirable people here. Yeah, right. It'll be like a like, documentary. Yeah, yeah. Your guys, like, get down here. Yeah, he's yeah. like, they're knocking on the door. Hey, John. Hey, I have some beers. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I heard you could give away a record. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's the last be... thing we want. No, that would but, be uh, bad. Well, that's... I have a very conservative neighbor who has guns, so maybe they'll take care of it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> just, just look, you know, get them informed, let them know. It's just like, there might be some strange people hanging around. Uh, shoot them. Shoot, shoot to me. Don't kill. Yeah, yeah, just in the leg. Yeah. I need their uh, streaming money. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, interesting uh, aspect. Okay, so I was thinking about it. Um, another reason why I want to talk to you is because you had a record label. Yes. Anchor Brain. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was so fucking hard. Yeah. <sighs> Total releases between the years of 2000, what, six was it? To 14? Eight or nine. Eight or nine releases mm-hmm. between four or five different bands, I think. Yeah, we did a Six Finger Satellite album, a Chinese Stars album, a Horror Paint 7 Inch, What Cheer Brigade. We did a couple of their albums, a band called Big Digits, a couple of records by Math the Band. Yeah. And um, Nuclear Power Pants was one of them. And I might be blanking on another one, but. That sounds about we, right. We tried so hard, and it, it just was a constant uphill battle. Yeah. <clears throat> when we launched it, we tried to. It basically launched shortly before streaming became oh. popular. I mean, it just yeah. seemed like every time we did something, a new... I don't know how record labels stay in business. I really have no idea. I think it's sheer value. I don't know how they do it. Yeah. I think it's value for the most part. Yeah. Because it's like, even if you can make you know, a little bit of money on this project by this band, by the end of this release, whatever it is, like, you yeah. know, if you're trying to sell the vinyl copies of it, let's just say, yeah. um, you know, that little bit helps. Yeah. Uh, it, the I more mean, you I'm, build up your catalog, I think it probably would, would <clears throat> start to kind of like make itself work kind of yeah. to a degree. I mean, I guess it makes sense because for a while, like a year or two or three years or however, we would make, we would get monthly checks that range between three and $400 from digital sales. And then we would just use that for like label maintenance and right. all that stuff. So I guess, yeah, maybe having those 10 releases generated that maybe if you had hundreds of releases or something that it would do. But then now I don't even know what people purchase digital music. And that was the thing What yeah. happened is that when we were making that little bit of money each month, and then we'd have a surge when we release a vinyl copy, but vinyl was, you know, it was expensive too. Right. And then when people stopped like buying digital, and then the streaming took over. It was just too much. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah. It was too, too challenging. It was occupying way too much of my time. And it was just, it was really hard because I wanted to make it work. And my partner, Clay, and I just, we worked so hard on it. Right. And nonstop. And it just, and then we had a few unfortunate um, situations with the band. Bands, um, you know, Six Finger had planned to do a little bit of touring and then they ended up playing, I think five shows to, to support the album. And, oh, 
um, what Chair Brigade worked very hard, and they were one of our more successful acts, and the Train Stars did, did pretty good. Matt the Band did pretty good, but then we released uh, another, um, you know, that band Big Digits and nu Nuclear Power Pants, and then they had some, um, like, it, some uh, issues in, like, their personal lives, which made them not be able to tour and you know okay. so that was just everything because the tour sales were like the only way that we could pay back the manufacturing right so it, it just became so exhausting and i just i couldn't do it anymore yeah it was a bummer yeah it's something i always kind of think about like it's one of those like little daydreams i have would be like huh if i come into some money maybe i could put mm -hmm. it towards you know putting a band's record mm -hmm. out yeah. But not a great idea. It is really, really it felt great though. Like I yeah. I only put my own albums out. And it was really, really fun because I remembered being able to put, you know, being a small part of releasing other people's albums and help them realizing, you know, their ambitions and right. and it would didn't feel as good as releasing my own music, but it actually felt really good to help to be a part of their excitement. Yeah, you know, and it felt good, and when they had success, I felt as though, in a weird, small way, I was having it. So I would say so. Success, so it felt really, really good, and it was really a hard, hard decision to, to stop doing it. Right. I just, it was, you know, it just was too much. Yeah. And at the time, I was, um, you know, get, I went back to grad school, and I just had my, my, my life was just getting so busy, and I just had to, something had to go. Right. And unfortunately, it was the label. Mm. But who knows? I, I still own the name. Maybe I'll bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> Take a hiatus. If any of those yeah. bands or if any of those albums need to be reissued, you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, so speaking of that, like, how many, like, because I'm interested in the whole idea about, like, this, this uh, like, pressing of records, whether it be on CD or vinyl or the digital downloads or, well, digital downloads is really kind of, doesn't really kind of, fit in because it's like mm -hmm. it's, a, it's it's infinite number yeah as any many as any, any many number of people will find it and want to download it or stream it that can be it's there any number right yeah. but uh the actual tangible effect like like how many records would you press for a um, band like initial release like yeah. just kind of like expecting like okay if it goes to second pressing like if these sell well mm -hmm. Like, what would you do? So the Chinese stars, we just kind of looked at what we were selling on average of our albums beforehand. So our first pressing of the Chinese stars album was a thousand. And then I think we ended up printing another five to seven hundred and fifty albums. Oh. And then it kind of, the sales slowed down. And mm -hmm. then um, I also went on to, I actually left, well not left Chinese stars, but just sort of um, you know, the reunion uh, with Arab on Radar was starting, and oh. I just I didn't make another record with Chinese Stars, but <clears throat> that's how we decided. We just looked at old sales, like how many did that sell, how many did that sell, and the record label that we were on, Three One G, just kind of gave us the numbers. The Six Finger Satellite, we only did five hundred, um, and it sold out right away. And then we were going to repress, but then they had told us they weren't going to be touring so then we didn't repress hmm. uh, but math the band they did uh, they did really well so we started i think at a thousand with cheer brigade we started at a thousand oh okay we just, yeah just kind of knew what they would what they would be projected to sell right but now i don't even know what a good like i don't know what a good album sells like i think I think our first album of Psychic Graveyard, I, kn I know the label only did 500 and there's only like a, what, like 50 copies left or something like that. So yeah. I don't know where that ranks. I don't know what a popular band yeah. vinyl sales are like versus, but it seems like 500 to 1,000 is usually the first test, uh, the first pressing of it. Because hmm. I, you know, most people, 80% of people are going to stream the album anyway. Right, yeah. Or band camp it or whatever. Yeah. I guess that puts things in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I wasn't kind of considering that. So I still have the old ideology of like, you know, you make a record and then you put it out and yeah. like stores carry it and people go and find it and whatever, or you carry it on tour when you're as your merch. Yeah, most of our sales are from on tour. Right. So when we play, we'll sell an average of ten to fifteen pieces of vinyl a night, and that 
that's the best. Which is good. Yeah, and then we'll, the distributor will take, literally take that 30, 40, 50 at a time. So yeah. if you think about worldwide, <laughs> that was a one, you know, one record in California, one in Chicago. <clears throat> you know, I don't know about, right. I mean, I go into record stores and buy it, but it, the demographic of, you know, 20 to 30 year olds, I don't know if they, I don't know how they, even if they engage well. Well, I think it's Some bigger day. now. Yeah. Like, I don't know if maybe, like, after Anchor Bank kind of officially closed its doors, final sales started peaking again. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I think realistically... Yeah, they did pick up. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know... But it's also so expensive to make right. final, and that's the problem. It's You may sell a lot, right? but I think you have to sell at least a 1000 to make a profit. Right. And yeah, the profit margin's really thin, I suppose. Really, yeah. I mean, they're about $5 a pop to make, even when you cut everything back. And right. It's and hard to sell them for, and stuff. Okay. Yeah, and you, you can sell them for 15 at a show, but you can't sell them to wholesale for 15 because right. they may have to mark them up to $25 or $30 or something right. like that. So the well, ban on tour is the best way, is the most lucrative for the label and for the band. Right. It's their, or it's the, the most easily... The easiest way to sustain a band's livelihood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is true. I mean, like, you know, being on tour, mm-hmm. I mean, that's how you make your money. Mm-hmm. I mean, and like, you know, I don't know what people think. I don't know what like, the layman's people's perspective is of like a band trying to be on tour, but it's just like, you need money. Yeah. You need money to that's keep expensive. on doing it. Like, yeah. you put gas in the tank, like, yeah. you know, you're traveling all this distance, so you have to get a hotel room, like, you yeah. have to eat. Yeah. That's and, one of the things that's always been really after doing this for 20 years has has really 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 surprised me is that when we started out and we would get like a good opening slot for a band where they're like oh there'll be lots of people here tonight Mm -hmm. and we would be main support we would be getting anywhere from like 250 to 350 350 dollars and this is like 2000 2001 99 98 and they would be like, that's the budget for the main support or whatever. Right. And then, you know, obviously then the headliner, and they deserve the money. They've been working their asses off for years and years. They deserve that money. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're still probably paying back the wreckages of their lives, <laughs> you know, by the time you get to that point. But what I find amazing is that even in the last five years, um, I might have to sneeze. Even in the last five years, that's still like the going rate for like main support is like three fifty, four fifty. And what I think is so amazing about it is how when we were tra- traveling at that time, gas was a buck twenty for right. a gallon, a dollar a twenty. Hotel rooms were forty, fifty. You know, literally touring is twice as expensive, mm-hmm. if not three times as expensive. But the rates are still the same. Yeah, and I've always been blown away by that. Uh, how the certain aspects of the music business have not evolved in that regard, yeah. you know, right. I'm just amazed at, and unless you find, you know, we have done some, um, recently we played with the band, the OCs and, and John, who's the person, you know, he's from Providence and stuff. And he, as a support act, us and the other support act were paid very well way above like music business standards. And I think that's because John is a really understanding artist, you know, but typically, yeah, it's just so strange to me. Mm. It's like, why, (laughs) why am I still getting what I got in 19, you know? Because you can get away with it. Yeah, it's really good. The promoters or whoever it is that make money off of the the shows or whatever, and it's like, they know it's just like, well, we can make this much, we can sell the tickets for this much, and They only expect this much, so we're going to give them that much. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, as a headliner, it's a different story. Like, the money as a headliner has gotten better. Yeah. But not support. Well, because you, um, you can kind of, like, dictate the ticket price. Yeah, ticket price. And, obviously, depending on the ticket price, it depends, yeah. like, yeah, like, yeah like, so the total income. Yeah. It's and just we'll, a very strange phenomenon yeah. that, I've, that I've noticed, and, I, and I'm out there, and I'm looking at the gas prices that are five dollars in California sometimes and I'm like this is so strange you get paid the same as <laughs> and, you know it's like it's just a weird 
Weird right. concept to me. <laughs> right, you can put like a whole night's pay right into your tank. Yeah, yeah, just because it's so, oh, yeah, God. So that's why, yeah, it's, it's just one of those weird things that, that I've noticed. It's not even like I'm arguing, I mean, great if there was a change, but it was just one of those weird, like, observations that I had in the last, you know, especially when Doomsday was doing some support dates and stuff, and I was like, this is, you do the support dates because you play in front of a lot of people, but you also recognize, well, we're not the headliners tonight, they're the headliners, right. but also at the same time, you're like, it still feels a little exploitative, <laughs> like, just, I don't know, it's yeah. weird, yeah. Yeah, no, I can imagine, I mean, especially because you've been doing it so long, it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, kind of, kind of feel like you have a little, a little more do than, than just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Psychic Graveyard is the new band, mm -hmm. and I've uh, been loving the new record. been uh, listening to the EP. I've been streaming it, so hopefully you get a little kickback from that. Oh, yeah. Um, I got a second house in that. Oh, yeah. I bet. <laughs> I just think this isn't enough. <laughs> um, yeah, the Psychic Graveyard EP is called The Next World, and uh, the debut is um, called Loudest Laughter. Studio in December to do our next one. Next full length. Yeah, next, I can't. It's exciting. Yeah, I bet. it's like a new relationship. There's this lust to make new music with new people. It's really fun because mm. um, uh, it's mostly all new people in this project, so it feels really good. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what else there is to to mention. Yeah, um, yeah. Buy the book if you haven't gotten it yet. It's on Tolson. Books out of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, I believe we're out of. Okay. Yeah. The other book, uh, the other know, book, and the other book stuff yeah. is uh, yeah. Heartworm Press. Right? Yeah, no, my other books are on Heartworm Press, which is. Uh, I, have a copy of, I have a copy right here. Oh. Yeah, look at that. It's a yeah. copy of this book. Yeah, Wes, yeah, Wes cool. from Cold Cave, American Nightmare, Some Girls. He's put out all of the other writing I've done. This is the first time I've released something outside of him. Um, mm -hmm. And it was mostly just because to have a, just a different type of experience. Yeah. And also Wes is just really, really busy right now. He's doing really well. And, um, you know, the timelines always get really drawn out if they're busy. And, and I was trying to get that out in time for all the dates that we, that Psychic Graveyard did this past summer. Oh, so, okay. And then it just kind of worked out this way. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's mm. a great read. You know, if uh, if anyone's not familiar with your work in general, I mean, this uh, is a retrospective between uh, three of the all three bands, right? Arab on Radar, Chinese Stars, and Second yeah. Graveyard. The Arab on Radar lyrics were unreleased lyrics from songs that were from that we wrote during the reunion, and then the other ones were just lyrics that were just had never previously been. So oh. in some of my old books, it would be mostly poetry with some lyrics. This is actually mostly poetry with, sorry, excuse me, mostly lyrics with just a little bit of poetry. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, the Chinese Stars lyrics were just things that I hadn't released before or published. There was, we recorded five, uh, there were Chinese Stars, four or five Chinese Star songs that we had kind of like demoed, like recorded them loosely but never release them and there's the lyrics are from there so it's kind of just stuff that hmm. you know there's no context to it and i just thought it would be neat to have it in the world yeah and then all the psychic like, graveyard stuff is stuff that released that we released it's from the lp and the uh, the uh, ep cool yeah and all the poems are just wacky prose poems that i wrote <laughs> yeah no, that's great i mean uh you don't need the, to, to downplay it like that. I mean, it's, it's good work. It's very good work. <laughs> Thanks. So I encourage people to pick it up if you can, if you can find it, or if you can probably order it online somewhere. Uh, just look, just look up Eric Paul, and you'll you'll find it. Yeah, but there is another Eric Paul that's a musician. Oddly enough. Oh, there is. Yeah. Who's I don't that? like that. No, it sucks. Where where are they? Who are they from? Where are they from? He's a singer songwriter. Oh, great. But I like it though, because a lot of times my students will Google me and they will find him and they'll just yeah. think, oh, my teacher is a nerd. And I like that rather than this Eric Paul. So, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'd rather than think other things about me than what I am. Weird. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. All right, man. Well, then um, I think I think we're pretty good. Awesome. I could talk for hours. No, I, I, and, I, and I would too. I absolutely would. But I know that, you know, 
are holding your, your family hostage. They are in the bedroom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I understand, like, that's why when I record at home, I have a separate building. Oh, you do? Be, yeah, it's, oh, just, it's a small great. little shed, I mean, but it's that's like... That's great, that's great. I love the idea of that. When I was really obsessed with Serial, there was a uh, an offshoot podcast called Crime, Truth and Justice or Crime and Justice or something, and it was a guy who was the chief of, like, a fire department in Michigan and got really obsessed with the Serial case, hmm. so he had an offshoot um where he did his own investigation into the crime, and I remembered he built a shed in his backyard and built a studio booth for it. Oh. And I don't know why I just loved that fact so much. Huh. But then his podcast got, got so successful because of, you know, Serial and how huge Serial was. Yeah. He ended up leaving his job as a firefighter and just making this podcast about unsolved uh, murders. Oh. Yeah, wild, right? Hey, it can happen. It's great. What's his fucking name? Bob something doesn't matter. He wasn't the guy from Cold, right? Because you turned me on to that, and I fucking hate you for it. That's a tough one. Too. Oh, God. I was just, <laughs> no one's ever heard that podcast if you're into the murder mystery <laughs> thing. That's, uh, it's intriguing, of, but very sad. Yeah, I was just... Yeah. There's yeah. a couple episodes where I was just like, oh, man, this is fucked up. Like, this is just making me feel bad. Yeah. Like, it's funny, though, with that. I started listening to it just because it was, like, you know, I'm one of the top sellers, and... Just listening to it, and I was like, this is crazy, this is crazy. But then there was one episode, which you probably know, where it's revealed what the, what the husband does. Yeah. That one, I had, I just cried. I just yeah. started crying yeah. like, uncontrollably because uh, I have a son that age, and you just can't help. And obviously you do too, and you can't right. help. You right. know, be like, how can someone do this? Right. Like, it's crazy. But, yeah, it's a, it's a, it definitely should have a bit of a warning, I think, with that one. Because there's uh, a long yeah. time you listen to it. Yeah. I mean, you're. I mean, you, you're, it sets you up for a huge failure. Yeah. But you're just like, to what degree? What's going to happen exactly? Yeah. yeah. I but, can't, uh, yeah. But, yeah. It just, and then finally, like getting the details is just like, oh my god. Yeah. This is so horrible. Yeah. Because a lot of the true crime is like, it's adults, and it's it's never good, but there's something about, I don't know, if, yeah. with adults, it's just it's it's horrible, but it's it something about when it's with children, it's really hard yeah well I think really that's the, hard that's the parental perspective yeah it's like you, yeah you know you can watch a certain commercial and start crying for no reason yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. just like anything that involves Soft children things. now it's yeah. just like you put your own child in that perspective and yeah then, like, you're constantly worrying and you're you're constantly yeah, yeah and you're overprotective and, yeah. right yeah. but the, i did not see like i didn't know anything about that i literally discovered that by just looking at like best sellers and I just said, oh, I'll listen to this. And I was like, oh, this is really engaging. And I was like, geez, it's getting a little bit weirder. And then the father-in-law, and he's in love with the... And I was like, yeah. this... And then he writes an album for her. And I was like, whoa, this is this is getting like to be like a John Waters movie. And then all of a sudden, it fucking changes on a dime. And you're yeah. like, whoa, I wish I could undo all that. You know, you really, I did not know. I, and I tell people now, I said... It's a really engaging story, but there's an aspect of it that's very troubling. Yeah. And be warned, I guess, if you, right. if yeah. you listen to it. Yeah. Either, either uh, take the bait on this one or don't. It's up to you. You'll never be the same again. Yeah. No, this guy's name is Bob something. He's a firefighter from Michigan, and I was so obsessed with the serial, like the first season of Serial. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Show. And um, and the following one, S-Town, Shit-Town. Yeah, it was also really good. That was that. really touching. But again, that that's, I, I was like, uh, my eyes filled up. I didn't expect that. Yeah, and that that surprise. It's um, the worst when you're walking around, and you're like crying and like. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna see it's gonna <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh well, the world is a very sad place, <laughs> and we do have a very upsetting president now. So right. is everyone, everyone's a deserve to get a good cry in. You yeah, know? yeah. No, it's good. It's good for you. It feels good. <laughs> I, I actually do uh, appreciate a good cry every now and then, mm. you know, uh, yeah. but because I, I don't do it often anymore, I think I, I think I yeah. used to have a, a bigger problem than I do now. I think it's uh, yeah, everything's so subsided yeah. in my older age. Yeah, it's just it's like you're less in touch with things because you're more in survival mode, you know. Mm. You're like, oh, wait, I I do feel things. <laughs> Shit, and it's good that. to feel things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Joe yeah. cried the other day. Like, uh, yeah. from listening to music. Whoa! I, I had put on, um, or it's like a big, big collection of records. Oh I got. my goodness. I put on Stevie Wonder. Uh, 
it was, uh, what's that double record he put out? Um, it's just like the best stuff, basically. About, oh, oh, well, he also has the different songs in the key of life. That's it. Yeah. 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 I put that on, and I, I, put, I put on the one side of one song of the record, and it starts with, Isn't She Love Me? I was just like, listen to this song. Cry, You're going to love this song. Crying. Yeah, it's just like, it's, yeah. a, it's a song about, about he that cried. he wrote for his daughter. Oh, no, God. not that song. Oh, okay. He, I was just like, what do you think of the song? He's just like, oh, it's good. Yeah. Because I realized that he likes the Bee Gees now. Oh, okay. I'm like, okay. All right. Like, I can get some Bee Gees. You have to love Bee Gees. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. It's upbeat. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. just like, it's not my go-to. I know but, what I mean, though. But he likes it. And I'm just like, okay. So what was the song that made him cry? I can't remember now, but it was a follow-up on that side of that record. So I'll have to look it up. But uh, but Because I was listening to it myself on my computer doing research and stuff like that in the house. Oh, that's beautiful. And he comes in. And wow. I see him like welling up. He's like, it's like, uh, he's like that. That song's sad. <laughs> I was just like, oh, dude, it's okay. Like you don't have to cry. It's like it's I understand. Like, or, or I was like, you can't. You can cry. It's totally fine. That it's just amazing. like it's okay to to music yeah. does that. Music yeah. does that to you, and it's it's totally okay. Like I don't mind. Yeah, that's why it exists. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to shame him for crying because I remember no. like when I was growing up, I felt like that. Like mm-hmm. first time I actually had a friend die, I I couldn't help it. I cried to my mom. And, I felt like ashamed that I was doing it. It was just like, I'm oh. supposed to be like this man. I'm supposed to like not cry, you know? I was just oh, like, wow. no, come and cry. Like, it's okay, man. Uh, well, I guess it's also too special in, in the sense that, you know, that it's okay to... Yeah, of course. Yeah, the joke is on the autism spectrum. Yes, and, yeah, I mentioned it before. Yeah, and they have a very abstract relationship with their feelings, yeah. you know? And what's really crazy, and I don't know how you feel about this, but when Wilder was young, my son, who also was on the autism spectrum, did not, he did not sleep for two years. And I, I, I'm not even kidding you when I say he didn't sleep. Yeah. And at the time, all the doctors thought it was you know, medical. They would, you know, now I feel like it's just sensory. It was a lot of sensory issues. Mm-hmm. But one of the, and he was constantly crying, like crying constantly. Yeah. And there was, I mean, Allison and I brought Wilder to the emergency room multiple times thinking there's no way a human being is crying this much that hasn't been shot, you know, like, what's wrong with this kid? Right. And they would just swaddle him and say, your son has colic, you know, and all this fucked up shit. Mm. But the only thing that soothed him, and I'm not kidding you, was Stevie Wonder. And we would really? constantly play Stevie Wonder for him, constantly. Wow. Um, what was the song? I'm blanking on the one particular song. But Which album? Do you remember the album? So we were listening to, like, a greatest hits. Okay. Um, and I don't know what album it was, but it was, um, she's, um, Susie was from something. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, God, I remember really Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was in Pigtails. And, anyway, it's, oh, it's okay. like that love song. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh. I'm drawing a complete blank, of course, right now. And I think it's because I listened to it like 3,000 times and I don't want to ever hear it again. But, um, and I'll never forget this, and there's actually a medical record of it because one time we went to Brown University as a colic clinic because mm-hmm. we were so, like, what's wrong with him if there's nothing medical wrong with him? I mean, now we know. Like, it was sort of the beginning of his sensory issues with his autism. Mm-hmm. And... We brought him to the colic clinic, and you see doctors there that are trying to figure out what colic is, and it's like one of this, one of the centers for colic in the, in the in the country. And they wrote down, well, what you know typically suits him when he's you know we're like the only thing that really work walks works is like walks outside at all hours of the night and day. And Stevie Wonder, and it's literally in his medical record. <laughs> Stevie Wonder was the only thing that would soothe him. Yeah. It was so fucking amazing that wow. I'm like, what is it about Stevie Wonder? He's really reaching these kids on the spectrum here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, really, that's yeah. so wild. But now when you hear Stevie Wonder, he's not as I always thought, man, he's gonna love Stevie forever. You know, yeah, doesn't really care for yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. no. Stevie Wonder and um, Exodus by Bob Marley. I have no idea why. Well, wow. he would he would love Bob Marley. So we would drive around in the car and just crank it whenever he'd start crying, and that's how we would calm him. Mm. I mean, it was insane. We were either walking around the neighborhood in a stroller, three in the morning, two in the morning, five in the morning, or we were driving around when we were kind of lucid enough to be able to drive a car, and he'd be in the back just cranking Bob Marley or Motown. 
and it would calm him for an hour or two. He'd rest and then get up, and it would, the cycle would start over. Right. You know, that's why my wife and I were like, well, one, one child's great. Yeah. Can't do this again. I won't make it. <laughs> no, I but, agree with you. I, yeah. I have too, and we, we were done. We were like, yeah, this is, this is it. It's a lot of work. It is. It sure is. But, uh, but I just, I can't wait to tell Allison the story that Joe wept to Stevie Wonder because she's going to freak out. Yeah. She's going to freak out. She's going to be like, that is crazy because that's all my other, yeah. the only thing that would calm him. I was made for loving you. Right, isn't it? I was made to love her. That I was made to right. love her. Okay. Yeah, Worship right. and adore her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my <laughs> CD wonder. Oh, that's a good one. Very <laughs> you can definitely really print that. Dance. You can print that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you another really funny. This will, I'll end on this. Right? Okay. This is sure. a very funny thing. So when Austin and I got married, it was like 12, 13, 000 years ago. I don't know. Um, thirteen years, fourteen years ago, we 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 had to pay for the wedding ourselves. Um, Allison's dad helped a little bit, which was really nice. Her mom helped a little bit. But, you know, we, we paid for a lot of the wedding ourselves. So when we were done, we didn't had realized, like, shoot, we can't really go and go on a honeymoon or something. Yeah. So uh, someone, I don't know who it was, was like, you know, you, if you go on these cruises, they're actually pretty cheap. And you can, like, buy a package. We can, you know, you can drink and eat and everything's sort of inclusive. And you can, you know, you can do kind of a cheap honeymoon. Yeah. And we looked into it, and we ended up finding, uh, you know, so for each of us, it was under, you know, I think $3,000 or something. We went on, like, a week-long cruise and got to the Bahamas and stuff. And we ended up, I think we ended up putting it on a credit card, and we probably still haven't paid it off. But um, that was our way to, go, you know, go on honeymoon. So we went on this Carnival Cruise Line, and it was really, really funny. So at one point, we docked in... Uh, uh, Puerto Rico, and then when the boat set sail again, they had a Stevie Wonder impersonator that was going to be performing that night, but they told the boat, like in an announcement, that the actual Stevie Wonder was on the boat, and people were literally believing that Stevie Wonder was on the cruise with them, yeah. and there was a man that was walking around and then it ultimately performed Stevie Wonder covers that night that looked like Stevie Wonder in like 1980 or 1978. Okay. But this is like 10 years ago, so this is like 2010. Like, not Stevie. No, but people on this cruise ship were convinced they were partying with Stevie Wonder. Yeah. And I'll, Allison and I to this day are still trying to figure out like, what did we witness? What the fuck did we, did nobody know? Or did they just delude themselves? I mean, they were eating so much and drinking so much, anything was possible. Yeah. But yeah, it was really funny. And they also had this like fake version of the Beatles love, you know, the Cirque du Soleil love. Oh, okay. And they had all these really like, it, oh my God, it was, it, in retrospect, it was an amazing honeymoon because it was like seeing something that I never thought I would see. Yeah. Yeah, typical surreal different. experience. Yes, very <laughs> surreal, very distinct type of person that goes out and yeah. eats themselves to death on a cruise ship and mm -hmm. drinks themselves to death. Seeing people passed out on the on the side, and it was all actually during the um, McCain Obama election. Whatever year was it? That was the year we got married. Oh, okay. So whenever that's how long we've been married, the year Obama. Then. So three three terms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. and. Uh, and uh, so hearing all the people, you know, talk politics on the, the and it left from um, New Jersey, mm -hmm. so it was like basically eighty percent of people from New Jersey. Wow. It was an amazing experience. I said, but anyway, amazing. we had a lovely time. We made the best of it. But yeah, that was my my funny Stevie Wonder story. So I just think it's something kind of intriguing that when we married, there was the Stevie Wonder event, and then our son was only eight and so. Yeah. yeah. So with that, listen to Songs in the Key of Life. Yeah, it's been great cool. hanging out with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs>